The City of Ohio State podcast takes a deep dive into the support services that keep Ohio State's Columbus campus running 24-7. Hear from industry experts in facilities, safety, transportation, and more. The City of Ohio State podcast is brought to you by the Office of Administration and Planning. Hello and welcome to the City of Ohio State podcast. I'm your host, Brooke Bartholomew. Last month, we chatted back to school safety with OSU PD. This month, we're joined by Ohio State's new vice president and CIO, Rob Loudon, who joined the university on August 1st ahead of the fall semester. Rob, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So there is no busier time of year for someone to start their Ohio State career than right as classes are beginning to kick off a new academic year. I'm sure it's been a whirlwind, but what has the transition been like for you so far? It's been amazing. you know, it's an incredible organization at an incredibly exciting time uh, to to join and be a part of. And so, uh, you know, as much as August is uh, a short preparation for the beginning of the fall semester, uh, I would say, you know, timing-wise, couldn't have picked a better time to start. And for those listeners who may not know, you oversee a group called the Office of Technology and Digital Innovation, or we call it OTDI. So can you give us a brief rundown of the size, scale, and scope of that team? Absolutely. We're a little over 500 professional IT uh, employees, uh, highly dedicated to supporting a pretty broad uh, swath of IT across the university. Um, We partner with pretty much every college, uh, Wexner Medical Center, um, and various units. So uh, we support the majority of the networks of the university. Uh, we provide ubiquitous Wi-Fi. So uh, as, as a new Buckeye, as I walk across the Oval, uh, I'm proud uh, and impressed at the same time for the uh, just ubiquitous Wi-Fi access that uh, I'm sure those that have been here longer take for granted. Uh, but as someone new, it's a very distinctive uh, and, and strong asset that we have. So those are just some of the things that uh, we're responsible for. Yeah, really impressive work happening. And prior to coming to Ohio State, you served in a similar role at fellow Big Ten institution, Indiana. In your short time at Ohio State, what have you noticed that's the same or maybe different than at IU? And what has you most excited about being a Buckeye other than that Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> you took the one that, you know, Easy win. Uh, super <laughs> exciting and, uh, you know, a, a true point of pride, the, the Wi-Fi installation that we have. You know, I would say just early into my time as a Buckeye, just absolute professional dedication from the IT organization. Uh, it, uh, it, it was clear to me uh, as I interviewed for the opportunity, as I met the IT staff, uh, there's a level of dedication and professionalism that um, both organizations uh, should be proud that they have in place and, and a truly supportive culture. Um, you know, IT folks uh, can, can be engineers uh, and, and very Boolean in their decision making, uh, but uh, I think a, a strong differentiator in the academy especially is when the IT organizations understand and appreciate their role in supporting the mission of the institution. Uh, And it it just rings clear uh, that is equally true and accurate here at The Ohio State University. And, uh, you know, what excited me most about being a Buckeye, um, I heard we had a winning football team. but That's right. uh, You know, that maybe wasn't the most exciting (laughs) thing. Uh, You know, I would say... uh, the focus on AI fluency, um, you know, the provost, the president, every faculty member that I've had uh, the opportunity to meet and talk with, um, vice provosts, uh, college deans, I think there's just a real sense of enthusiasm and excitement behind a, a prolific change in technology where many other institutions might take that, uh, that challenge and be a bit fearful, um, maybe even pessimistic about the impact that it might have uh, on our kind of tripartite mission. But uh, it's clear to me here, not just from the leadership, but broadly across the entire university, there's, there's really a passion for exploring it and trying to figure out how we can take advantage of this. So that, that, that was probably one of the most exciting things coming. 
And going off of that, technology is constantly changing and evolving, but it seems nothing is changing faster than, as you mentioned, artificial intelligence. So how can OTDI support Ohio State's AI fluency initiative to prepare all future students to work and live in an AI world? Yeah, I mean, emphasize the faster than uh, the change of artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've shared with many, um, you know, we talk about dog years. Uh, and that's a long period of time, uh, you know, in comparison to human years. And artificial intelligence is really, in terms of pace, the exact opposite. Uh, there's a lot of studies out now that are saying that it's uh, you know, what would take a year in technological change in the past now happens in about three months. The adoption of artificial intelligence, you know, OpenAI is just an example, has set worldwide records on uh, achieving a million uh, member mark. That happened in 24 hours. Um, in comparison, something like Facebook took almost a year to hit those kind of numbers. So, you know, to say that it's moving fast is almost an understatement for the pace of change in uh, technology. Um, and, you know, and, and when I think about what the role of OTDI is, as fast as it's moving, it's, uh, it's a bit nebulous. Um, you know, when you ask somebody, what does artificial intelligence mean to you, you're going to get as many different answers back as people that you talk to. Um, but that's okay. Um, I think that's a good thing, especially in higher education, where we have a culture that reinforces exploration, uh, whether it's exploration in the classroom, uh, exploration in research, or even in the clinical missions. Um, this is a time for broad exploration and AI fluency, the way that we will lead globally in this space is going to be through the strength of our 8,700 plus faculty members exploring it with nearly 70,000 learners. Um, and so it's exciting. Uh, it is going to move fast. Um, it's an ambitious uh, goal to have that you know our, our students, our undergrads will graduate being fluent in two languages, and AI will be one of those two. Uh, and so, you know, I think OTDI will be here uh, to support that, uh, both in the beginning, during that period of exploration, but over time, um, it will mature. Uh, the space technologically will become um, more robust, and then you, I think, will see OTDI applying its talent, its resources, uh, and its processes to uh, implementing that at scale um, where it makes sense, uh, where the exploration uh, is resulting in fewer options um, and uh, more consistent practices. Uh, but right now, I would just emphasize it is a period of exploration, and uh, we should be excited about that and embrace that with the, the skills and strengths that the Academy brings to the equation. Cybersecurity is obviously a big focus of your group. So how critical is the work of this team? And can you give our listeners an idea of the type of volume it handles each month or year, maybe? You know, cybersecurity is critical in any organization. It doesn't really matter if you're a large, you know, public land grant R1 institution or if you're a small company. Um, cybersecurity plays a, a critical role in your ability to offer up your services. Um, so it's absolutely critical. The work the team does there is uh, incredibly important and relevant. It's also one of those areas where uh, folks don't think about it until something bad happens. And so it's kind of like the lights. When they're on, you don't think about how much work, effort, and infrastructure is supporting that. When they go out and you're dependent on them, um, you instantly gain an appreciation and maybe even a bit of a frustration uh, for their uh, not being available to you. Um, the volume that an institution like ours handles in this space, you know, whether you look at things like email um, as, as the number one attack entry point uh, for any organization. Um, so those messages that you get, please don't click on those when you know that it's not uh, an appropriate message. But um, you know, 90% of the volume of mail that comes into the university is not needed. It's spam, it's junk, and it can be malicious and damaging. So a lot of the work uh, that you don't see behind the scenes is blocking those, stopping those, 
um, filtering those out so that they don't have a chance to be acted upon. Um, you know, we have almost 20,000 wireless access points at the institution, indoor, outdoor, every building is another critical attack vector point is our network. Um, we got some opportunity uh, in our network space. We, we, we're a bit distributed in ways that uh, our peers um, have taken a more traditional um, and uh, foundational approach to, so we have some opportunities there. But uh, when you have those kind of volumes, we have uh, the second largest deployment of Aruba wireless access points on the planet. Uh, we are second only to 7-Eleven, and 7-Eleven has a, a distribution model that's a bit larger than ours. So uh, we are a top second, and again, it's a point of pride. You know, the ubiquity of it is impressive, uh, but uh, the cybersecurity controls that we put in place there so that visitors, um, of which we have uh, many to the university, can get on and access things to the daily interactions clinically, research, educationally, in all the spaces across campus. Uh, it's a pretty critical, important piece and, and give you a sense of the, the work and effort that our cybersecurity team puts in on a daily basis. That is incredibly impressive. And the fact that you're saying that we have so many spam emails coming through, I had no idea because I don't even receive them. And that just goes to show, back to what you said, I don't receive them because of what the team does. That's so impressive. So since joining Ohio State, you've met with key stakeholders and you've received good feedback about OTDI's managed IT services operation. So what is MITS and why is that model so successful for the units that have adopted it in your view? So I, I haven't met with all the deans, uh, but I've <laughs> met with many and uh, all but one um, leverages the managed IT services. So in a nutshell, managed IT services really embedded IT in a college. Um, some of our peers in the Big Ten have uh, a more uh, aligned IT organization than we have here at The Ohio State University. And, uh, you know, I would say MITS ups our ante in the colleges that take full advantage of the services they provide. It's the same IT folks that were a part of the college, uh, that are in the college, that know all of the culture and the specifics uh, and the uniqueness of the college, its faculty, its researchers, its staff, its students, its buildings, its classrooms, its IT-enabled spaces. Um, but they do it in a consistent and collaborative way with the rest of OTDI and the MITS services. So um, I would say without exception, um, meeting with the deans that have made the conscious decision to move to this collaborative approach, uh, glowing uh, support for that. Um, and hopefully uh, if there's a single other group out there that's not in this model um, and has interest uh, I would be very happy to talk with them about taking up uh, the opportunities that it represents because it, it really is core to the collaborative nature of the academy. Um, and, and having that aligned, embedded, um, collaborative structure really advances all things in the IT space, including AI fluency. And one last thing here, we are a little more than one month away from Veterans Day, and I can't help but acknowledge and also thank you for your service to our country. You served in the U.S. Navy, and your service is something you share in common with President Ted Carter. So how do those experiences shape you as a person and a leader? You know, it, it'd be hard to cover in this uh, short interview all the things that I did in my short time. Uh, my career in the military was uh, a fraction of President Carter's. Um, you know, I would say it's a commitment to service that um, one makes consciously and voluntarily, which I think is, is a very distinguishing component of, of our country. Um, and you, the, the camaraderie that comes out of that experience um, at, a, at a pivotal time, no different than you know, our, our students coming to campus for the first time at a young age for, for many, um, those experiences in the military at foundational periods in your, your life um, are lessons and experiences that you apply your whole life. And so it's, uh, it's not uncommon uh, when folks that have served 
meet each other for the first time, they, they find a kind of a kindred connection very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I, they shape you as a person and a leader. Uh, I often say, you know, you can learn as much from a poor leader as you can a strong leader, and maybe uh, you learn what not to do um, or what you'll never do if you're ever in that role and, and have that opportunity. But uh, nothing but uh, positive experiences for me personally. Um, six years roughly in the Navy um, and, and look back at it very fondly. Well, thank you again for your service, and thank you so much for your time today. Welcome to Ohio State. We're proud to have you as a Buckeye. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. The City of Ohio State podcast is brought to you by the Office of Administration and Planning. Until next time, be kind and go Bucks.